Hey everyone, welcome back to Take You Forward. So in this video, we are going to learn about C++ STL. Now, what is STL? STL is basically standard template library. Now, in order to write codes in C++, assume you're, you're going to use a container or an algorithm. A lot of times what happens is you don't need to predefine the container or write the long, long codes for that container or for an algorithm. So STL is basically a compilation of algorithms, containers, iterators, functions in a minimized version so that you don't have to write lengthy lines of code and you can use that STL and you can get access to a container or to an algorithm. So in this video, I'll be teaching you all the STL that is actually required to get started with DSA. So please make sure you watch this video till the end to understand or to learn C++ STL in depth. So without uh, wasting any time, let's get started. So let's understand the skeleton of a C++ code. So you can see this is the entire skeleton of a code and the first line is hash include bits slash stdc plus plus dot h generically uh, this is nothing but a library and you would have uh, learned about something like math dot h so in order to include all the algorithms in math library you have to hash include math dot h similarly in order to include all the libraries in string you have to give string dot h similarly if you are wanting to add anything you have to actually write hash include the library dot h name for sure. Now imagine you're writing an algorithm or a program where you require a bunch of libraries. So you cannot actually waste a lot of time in including all the libraries individually. So what C++ tells us, okay, hey, listen, I have all the libraries in inside this stdc++.h. So just include this one and all the libraries are automatically included and I don't need to individually add them. Now this is the int main where you actually write the entire lines of code. Now what is this actually for using namespace std. Now imagine just for a case imagine I write scene of a and a is an integer. So this works but if you just omit this line this will actually give error. Now if you don't add this line you actually have to write std double colon scene of a or std double colon c out of a. This basically takes an input into a this basically prints the a into the screen. So if you don't write using namespace std, this you have to write every time. So that's a again hectic process. So that is the reason what we do is we write using namespace std and we omit this. But if you want to know about more in depth, you can definitely read a lot of articles. I'll be leaving a link of an article in the description below. You can check that out. So before moving to the STL part, let's understand functions. So there are a couple of functions. One is the void. So if you write void and probably print and over here you give C out, let's say my name Raj and I call the print function. So what happens is this print function calls and this will output Raj in the screen. Now this is a void function. What does a void function means? It will not return you anything. Okay, so that is one kind of function and the other kind of function is a return type function. Assume I write int of sum a int of b and I say can you please return a plus b and over here I say int s equal to sum can you just do a sum of 1 and b. So what happens is it calls this function passes 1 into a passes 5 into b and returns a plus b yes and it returns a plus b. So you get a plus b that is basically 1 plus 5 6 into the s and now if you do a c out of s what happens is this actually prints 6 into the screen. You need to understand this. Now this is a return type function, right? Now this can be a double, this can be anything. Like you can use any data type as you wish to. So these are the basic stuffs about the C++ skeleton of a code. Okay, okay. So before moving to the next part of the video, I'd love to thank the sponsor of this video, which is Coding Ninjas. Now, Coding Ninjas is India's leading at tech platform. If you want to learn DSL Go course, chahiye, computer programming, ka chahiye, machine learning, ka chahiye, data analytics, ka chahiye, web development, ka chahiye, Android development, ka chahiye, technical field, you can definitely check out the courses at Coding Ninjas. Now, why Coding Ninjas? Because in case courses are very well structured, so that your learning path is very well curated. And also, the courses are very well curated because these courses are prepared by people who have been at IITs as well as Stanford and by the people who have been at Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Now, if you don't believe it, you can check out the Facebook as well as the Google rating of Coding Ninjas. The best thing about them that I find personally is the doubt resolution time. Like the average doubt resolution time in the last one year has been 10 minutes. Like if you're raising a doubt, it gets 
solved within 10 minutes so that's the amazing like that's the most amazing thing that they do provide so if you are looking out to buy any of the courses you can check out the link in the description you can easily get an additional 20 percent discount on whatever price that has been going around so guys make sure you check out coding ninjas the link will be in the description now it's time that we move into the actual part that is the c plus plus stl so you need to understand that C++ STL is divided into four parts. The first being algorithms, the second being containers, the third being functions, the fourth being iterators. So as of now, we will be learning about containers. It can be vector, it can be queue, set, map, and a lot of other things. And we, during the course of learning containers, I'll be also teaching you what are iterators. So these couple of things we'll be learning at first. After that, I'll be talking about different algorithms and different functions that do exist in C++ STL. So before moving on to containers, you have to actually learn about pairs. Now, what is pairs? Pairs is a part of utility library. Okay. Now imagine I say that I want to store a couple of integers. Like I want to store one and I want to store three. So the only way that you can do is you can store it in a pair. Now, how is pair defined? You define the pair stuff. And then you see the first stuff that you want to store is of integer data type. The second stuff that you want to store is of integer data type then you enclose them into curly braces so what happens is this actually stores everything into a variable p so this variable p is now having one comma three that is the meaning of this particular line so that's how you define now in place of this int you can also have something like double string character the data type can be anything okay now if p is storing something like one comma three now, if I'm accessing P, it's actually a pair. What if I want to access this one? What if I want to access this three? So it's very simple. What you say is you just write P dot first, P dot first, and that will go and access this particular one. And if you write P dot second, that will go and access this particular three. So that is as simple as it can get. So if you're printing P, uh, P dot first, one gets printed. If you're printing P dot second, three gets printed. I hope uh, this is clear. Now imagine you are wanting to store. So as of now, you know that if you declare an integer data type or a string data type or a character data type, you can always store a single variable. Like if I want to store int a equal to two, that's fine. And I also know if I want to store two variables, I can use something like pair. But what if the question comes up and they see that when I store three variables, four variables, five variables, can you do it? Yes, we can do it. We can use the nested property of pair. Yes, we can use the nested property of pair. Now imagine I say you that you're going to store one, three, four. So what you'll see is, okay, I have one pair and I know this pair can store two guys. So this is the first guy and there's a second guy in a pair. So what I'll say is the second guy can be of a pair data type. Thereby the second guy stores two guys in itself. That is how you can do it. If you're wanting to store three variables, Got it? Like pair of integer. Then in the second guy, you say that I'm going to store a pair in itself. So basically one comma and the second guy is a pair. So again, a curly brace and three comma four. So that's how you can also store three. And eventually if they're asking you to store four variables, you can go nested, 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 nested that you can improvise. Okay. So that's how you actually store more than two variables in a pair. But now if you want to access this one, now, if you remember well enough, I told you pair contains two guys, right? And this guy was called first. If you remember well enough, this guy was called first and this guy was called second, correct? Now, but this second guy now stores two guys. So can I say this guy is nothing but first you get second, then seconds first. So seconds first is what this particular guy is. And what is this guy? This is nothing but the second dot second. So this is second dot second as simple as that. So this is how you can easily access. So if I ask you what is p dot first, it's one. If I ask you what is p dot second dot second, it's actually four. If I ask you p dot second dot first, it's actually three. This will be the output if I write C out. Okay. Now what if I declare now as of now you would have been declaring arrays like integer array, right? Or character array or something like a string array. But can I declare a pair array? Yes, you can declare a pair array. The data type can be anything. Pair can also be data type. Now this is the index zero. This is the index one. This is the index two now. So you are storing pairs in your array indexes as of now. So pair can be treated as a data type. It generally lies inside the utility library. Yes, it lies inside the utility library. Okay. Now if I'm, if I'm trying to access array one, so that's basically this 
dot second. Now, of this guy, which is the second, that's five. So if I'm trying to print this, this is going to print five. So this is the entire knowledge of pair that is required in order to get started with data structures and algorithms. And the next part we'll be learning about vectors. So the first container that we will be learning is vectors. Please understand every possible function about vectors because these functions will be similar in all the other containers like queue, list, map, set. So please, please make sure you understand all the functions in vector in depth. So till now, if I ask you to store five values, the normal thing you would have done was you would have declared an array of size five and that will be giving you access to five possible indexes, right? If you remember well enough, this gives access to five possible indexes. The first one being zero, the second one being one, two, three, four. Now, but afterwards, if you want to modify it, like if I want that, I want to enter one more element. I cannot modify the size of this array because this array has been declared of size five and I cannot modify the size because arrays are constant in size. So this is where something like vector comes in. Vector is a container which is dynamic in nature. Like you can always increase the size of the vector whenever you wish to. So if there is a requirement where you do not know the size of a particular data structure that will be required, that's when you think of a vector and that is the best place to use vector. So vector is a container only, okay, which stores elements in a similar fashion as the array does, okay. Now in order to declare vector, it's very simple. You just give the vector name, then you give the data type, it can be integer, double, char, string, anything. And then you declare the data type name, like over here, it's V. It can be Raj, it can be Striver, it can be Vec, it can be ABCD, it can be anything, okay. So right after that, there's a function as pushback. So if you're saying pushback of one, what it does is, this line basically does is, it creates an empty container, remember this. It creates an empty container. In the next line, it says pushback of one. So this empty container says, okay, I'm empty. So I'm gonna take one into it. So pushback of one will do this. I'm gonna take one into it. Now there is another function as emplace back. What do you mean by emplace back? It's a similar to pushback. It is similar to pushback. So the moment you do emplace back to, it dynamically increases its size and inserts two at the back. It dynamically increases its size and pushes two in the back. Now generically emplace back is faster than pushback. Now you can find the reasoning why in Quora. I'll be leaving the link in the description. Okay. Now. This is how you can define vector. Now, can we define vector of a pair data type? You can again define vector of a pair data type, as I said. So what you just need to do is you need to change the data type declaration inside this. So if you just change it, you can always, but over here, there's a trick. As I said, there are a couple of ways in which you can insert elements into vector. One was pushback. The other one was in place back. So if you're using pushback, you have to insert like one comma two. You have to give the curly braces in order to enter like in order to insert a particular pair but if you're using emplace back and you write without curly braces one comma two emplace back automatically assumes it to be a pair and takes it as an input and inserts into the vector that you have defined so that is how emplace back is different from pushback in terms of syntax now what if i want to declare a container with a lot of elements already filled so imagine this is the size. Now this is how you can also declare something of a size. Like this is the size that you can give. So what happens is a container containing 100, like containing five instances of 100 is already defined. Yes, a container containing five instances of 100 is already defined where this is the zeroth index, this is the first index, this is the second index, this is the third index, and this is the fourth index. So a container of size five is already defined with five instances of 100. What if I don't want to declare with 100? You can just declare of this. If you do this, what happens is a container of size five with five instances of zero or any garbage value is declared. Now this depends on the compiler, okay? That's how you can easily do it. So similarly, if I uh, do something like V1 of 520, this will uh, declare a container of five instances of 20, okay? Now what if? I want to copy this container into some other vector. So you just need to declare another vector v2 and you need to pass on this particular vector v1. So v2 will be the similar container, but a copy of it, like a copy of it, not the same one. It will be another container, 
of five instances of 20. So this is how generically the declaration is. If you know these kind of declarations, it does work. You don't need to declare any further. Now you might be thinking, but Shriver, what we, what if we de, uh, define the size of the vector to be 5? Can we increase it afterwards? Yes. Even after this, you try this line, push back 1. After this line, if you try this, it increases its size and inserts 1 at the back. Yes, even if you try this line, after this, it will increase its size and expand to a size of 6. So it is allowed. It's dynamic in nature. You can always increase the size of vector even if you are predefining the size to be 5. Remember this. Now how do you access elements in a vector? One of the easiest ways is imagine your vector is like having 20, 10, 15, 5 and 7. Imagine uh, this is what your vector as of now is, the container as of now is and this is the zeroth index as I told you. This is the first index, second index, third index and fourth index. The best way uh, to access them is you can say v1. So if you say similar to array, if you say v1 it means 10. This actually means 10. If you say v3, it actually means 5. So you can actually access it in the similar fashion as you do for an array. Okay, that's how you can access it. That's one of the ways like you can write directly v0 or you can write v dot at. Generally, uh, people don't use this, so you can just avoid it. You can simply uh, use the stuff that you use in array. Okay, what's the other way? The other way is an iterator. Yes, the other way uh, is an iterator. Now, I was telling you that through uh, through the lecture, we will be learning about containers and iterators. So, let's understand iterators. What is an iterator? Imagine the vector, like, let's take the same vector only, 15 and 6 and 7. Imagine this was the vector, okay? Now, if I write... Like for iterator, you have to write this. Whatever whatever data type you have taken, vector, that data type, double colons, and you have to write iterator, and this can be anything. This can be it, this can be byt, this can be anything. This is just a name. But the syntax is the data structure, data type, double colon, iterator, this. And you write v dot begin. So iterator basically means it points to the memory address because these guys would be stored somewhere in the memory like it this 20 would have been somewhere stored in the memory right and that memory can have any address the address can be 8567 something something the memory address can be anything this 10 will be right after that this 15 will be right after that right so all these possible values are actually stored in memory so what we do is if we write v.begin it actually points to that memory it points directly to the memory right not to the element it points to the memory understand that v dot begin means it's pointing to here but on the memory okay so if you're trying to print v dot begin you're printing the memory address not the element and in order to access like if you have uh, read about c plus plus in order to access anything that is in the memory you just write star like if i write star v dot begin understand this v dot begin is going to give you the memory this portion and the moment you write star the element inside this is accessed now let's understand again if i'm writing v dot begin this is actually pointing to the memory where 20 is okay the next time i'm doing i'm saying hey iterator can you just move ahead so this begin does this this goes here so now the iterator instead of begin is right at the next memory address because i've shifted the memory and inside all of these are contiguous memory locations. All of these are contiguous memory locations. So if you are shifting it plus plus, it moves to the next memory. Again, if you do it plus plus, moves to the next memory. After that, if you are doing star of it, what will happen? What will happen? As of now, it was 20. So if you do star of it, this actually prints 10 because it has shifted to 10 and now you are saying star. Access the value at that memory. So you get 10. I hope that makes sense. Okay. What if right after this, I do an it plus 2. So basically, I'm saying shifted by two positions to this portion. Shifted directly by two positions to this portion, which has a 6. Now, if I try to print this, it will print 6. So this is how you can easily use the iterator. Iterator is nothing but points to the memory where the element is lying. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So we are talking about iterators. Now, you must be thinking, do we have any other iterators apart from begin? We do have. We have something like end reverse end and reverse begin okay now imagine i have something like 10 20 30 40 as the vector 
Okay, so this is what the vector is. So if I'm saying vector dot end, like where does this point to? Remember this, end will not point to this portion. End will not point to this portion. Instead of that, end will point to somewhere right after 40. The memory location that is after 40. Now, if you on this iterator, do an it minus minus, then this iterator will move to 40. Then only this will move to 40. So, end points to a memory location that is right after the last element. Please understand, this is very, very important in terms of iterator. So you understood about end, but what about something like reverse end? Now these couple of things are never used, but just, just know it like it's never ever used. What is reverse end? Reverse end basically means I am going to reverse this. I'm going to reverse this. So apparently the reverse is 40 at first, then 30, then 20, then 10. So now the end is 10. So right after end. So that's this position is where it will be pointing. That's this position is where it will be pointing. Reverse end. End means right after, right? And reverse begin will be pointing to this. Reverse begin will be pointing to this. Now there is a specific thing about this. It moves in the reverse way. Now if I try to do IT++ on this, if I do IT++, IT as of now is pointing here. IT++ will move here. Yes. And after this, IT++ will move here. So it's a reverse iterator. You have to think it in the reverse way. Like if you just uh, think this array in the reverse, it's 40 vector rather, 40, 30, 10, uh, 20, 10. And now if I talk about end, this is end. And if I talk about begin, this is begin. And if I say begin plus plus, it moves to 30. So it's that way. Reverse. Everything is in the reverse order. Never used. Do you need to know? Just know it for the sake of knowing. But no one is going to ask you. We have uh, discussed about v of 0, v of at of 0. What is v dot back? As the name recommends, if the vector is having something like this, v dot back means the element which is at 30 is the element which is at 30 that is the meaning of this now if i'm if i'm wanting to print the vector there are a couple of ways imagine i have 10 20 30 as the vector and i want to print it the simplest way is i know the indexes are 0 1 2 so i can directly loop from 0 1 2 like i can just go across and say ki i'll loop from 0 1 2 and print it that's a very simple way the other thing is i say i'm going to do it iterator wise because i know this guy is begin. So I write begin and I know the last guy is end. Right after the last guy is end. So I'm going to run the iterator till it does not reach the last guy. I'm going to do an it++. The first time I get 10. Next I move it, I get 20. Next I move it, I get 30. And I will print every time star of it. And this is how you can print the entire vector. This is how you can print the entire vector. But, but, but there is a shortcut. Now you must not be like, no one wants to write these long syntaxes because STL means short, like standard template library, but it means everything in a very simpler fashion. So STL gives you something like auto. So if you write auto, it automatically assigns it to a vector iterator. You don't have to say that this is a vector iterator. You, you don't need to define the data type. It automatically defines the data type. Now, even if you write integer a equal to five, so you're defining a to b of integer data type. Even if you write something like auto of a equal to five, computer automatically says that this is an integer. So this a will be of integer data type. So if you write auto, the data type is automatically assigned according to the data. According to the data, the data type is automatically assigned. Like if this would have been something like Raj string and I would have written auto of a, a would have been automatically string. So auto means auto assignation. So that's, that's the beauty of C++. Uh, for some time you don't know the data type, you can just write auto. C++ will take care of it and it will automatically assign the data type for you. The other way to print the vector is using the for each loop. So if I use this for each loop, which is it on v. So it basically means if the vector is 10, 20 and 30, if I'm saying it. First time it is here, next time it is here, next time it is here. And you can simply print the it. Auto means on the data type, please iterate on the data type. First iterates on the 10, not an, not an iterator, not, not an iterator. This means over here int because it is of integer data type. Automatically iterate 10, then 20, then 30 and automatically prints it entirely. So that's about how to declare a vector, how to use iterator in a vector, how to print a vector. Now let's understand 
the deletion in a vector. So imagine I want to delete something. So there is something as an erase function. And if I have the vector like 10, 20, 12, 23, I say begin dot plus one. Now in order to uh, use the erase function, there are a couple of things. Either you give the iterator that like the location of the address, the location of the address that you want to delete, that this is the address that I want to delete. Please, please delete this address. So I'm saying, okay, begin plus one. What does this mean? Begin plus one means 20. So if you just do erase of this address, so the vector will be now 10, 12, 13. The vector will be reshuffled. The vector will be reshuffled into 10, 12 and 13. That is how the reshuffling will go on. So that is one way to erase. So we have understood how to erase single element. But what if I have a vector like 10, 20, 30 and 40 and 50 and I say striver, I want to delete uh, these couple of elements. I don't want to go single. Do you have something? I say yes, I have. And that's like erase. And I say give me the starting address and give me the end address after the element. Very important. End address after the element. So starting, if I want to delete 20, can I say that's nothing but begin plus one i can say because right after begin that is where 20 is i want to delete 30 that is begin plus two but i said right after what do you want to delete so that's begin plus three that's begin plus three three is pointing to here so i want to delete this portion but you have to give this end after after the guy that you want to delete after right right after 30 you have to give the address so apparently it deletes start and this is something like this end is not included. The start is included. Got it? So please make sure you give something as which is not included right after one, right after that. Okay. So that's how you can easily delete it. Okay. So for this example, we have 10, 20, 12, 23, 35. What do you mean by plus two? That means 12. What do you mean by plus four? Plus two, plus three, plus four. So plus four is here. So apparently this and this will get deleted. And you will be left out with 10, 20 and 35. I hope that makes sense. Now, we're going to learn about insert function. Insert. Again, you, if you want to insert something, it's very simple. First of all, if you declare this, this creates 100, like two instances of 100 in a container. Now, if I want to insert uh, 300 right at the start, right at the start. So I say uh, dot begin and please insert 300. So this does is this inserts right at the beginning okay 300 now imagine you had like 10 20 30 40 okay and i want to insert something here i want to insert a 5 here so do you write this is the first position this is the first position so instead of begin you have to write begin on the first position can you please insert 5 so if you write this this 5 will go here and get inserted right at the first position that's how you do insert now that was for single element you inserted single element what if i say that you have 10 20 uh, 30 40 as the vector and i want to insert two fives imagine i want to insert two fives how do you do that so you say i want to insert at the first position the number of elements that i want to insert and the number that i want to insert so this will do is this will take five and five and insert it right after 10 so this makes it 10, 5, 5, 20, 30, 40. So if I say over here, you had 30, 100, 100. So I'm saying begin plus 1, which is right after 300. Two positions, like two, two occurrences of 10. So two occurrences of 10 inserted. Understood? Very simple. So that's how the insert function does work for this. Now what if you have a vector and you want to insert it into some other vector? Now imagine I say that, okay, I have a vector like, uh, for this example, we have 50, 50. So I had a 50 and 50 vector. Okay. Now this vector is named as copy. So this is the line that declares that. Okay. Now I already had this vector 30, 10, 10, 100, 100. And now I want to insert this 50, 50 somewhere. So at that somewhere, I give that address and I say, please en enter this entire vector. Please enter this entire vector. So it will easily take this entire vector and enter it. If you want to have a portion of this vector, you can give that starting portion and you can give this after end portion and that will also do it. Again, not required. What is required is erase and this portion. This uh, is hardly required. If you just know erase and 
insert about a single element does okay that's how you can easily do about vector now what are the other functions in vector b dot size will give you how many elements are there in the vector as of now dot pop back if this is the vector pops out the last element dot swap is very simple if this is a vector v1 this is a vector v2 it swaps the vector as the name recommends v dot clear doesn't matter how big your vector is trims it down to an empty vector trims it down to an empty vector erases everything okay and v dot empty says does your vector like if your vector also has like a minimum of one element it says not empty not empty but if the vector has nothing it will say true empty so these are the functions that are generically required in a vector so the next container that we will be learning is list a list is exactly similar to vector but the only stuff in list is it is it gives you front operations as well now list is a container again dynamic in nature same way of declaration you can push back to you can emplace back forward so this is the list that will happen if you push back two and four and after that if you say push front this front goes over here five like it directly pushes it into the front in vector you had to use the insert operation and if you're inserting somewhere that does take a lot of time like insert function in a vector is very costly like we will we will read about time complexities in further data structure algorithmic lectures but as of now just remember an insert in a vector is costlier and in list since the internal operation is a doubly linked list like a doubly linked list is maintained for a list and for a vector a singly linked list is maintained so thereby something like push front is very very cheap in terms of complexity time complexity wise when you compare it to a vector okay and there is in place front as well all of the functions begin uh, r and reverse and size clear empty all of the functions are similar to vector so i'll not be explaining that okay so that is about list now the next container that we will be talking about is dq again similar to list and vector you just declare it push back push front pop back pop front back front and all of the functions are similar i'm not going to explain this as well it is exactly similar to list and vector so the next container that we will be learning is stack now stack is something as lifo lifo means last in remember this last in first out the guy who went in last is the guy who will come out at first so generally you can uh, just imagine a stack to be a data structure like this and this is how you declare a stack stack the data type and the variable name okay so i've declared the variable name like this I'm saying uh, push one, so I push one. I'm saying push two, I push two. I say push three, I push three. I'm again saying push three, I push three. I say in place is similar to push, so I say push five. Now, these are the push operations. Right after that, if someone says stack dot pop, so as I said, who's the last guy who went in? The last guy that went in, you know, is nothing but five. So this will print five. Is yes, this will print five? Now realize. This over here indexing access is not allowed. You cannot say this is index zero. This is index one. Something like this you cannot say. In stack there are only three functions. One is push. One is pop. The other one is stop. All other there like size are clearer there. But these are the generic three functions that you have to deal with. So if I'm saying top, it gives you five. But the five is still in the stack. The five is still in the stack. Now the moment I say pop. It deletes this from the stack. Now five is not in the stack. Now if I'm saying top, right before five was there three. So it prints three. Now if I'm at this moment saying stack dot size, there are four elements. So I print four. If I'm saying stack is the stack empty, the answer is false. It has four elements. Now if I'm saying swap it to some other stack, I declare another stack one, and I say, can you please swap it? So swap is very understandable both uh, both the guys will swap so i hope push is clear pop is clear pop means delete top means just tell me what is at top you don't need to delete just tell me what is at the top so that is how the stack stl works like now talking about complexity wise in stack all the operations are bigo of one operations everything happens in constant time so let's learn about the next container now now the next container that we will be learning is a queue data structure now a queue data structure is similar to stack but over here it is fifo okay fifo means first in the guy who gets in first 
comes out first stack was last in okay now you can uh, you can just think it in this way uh, like if you if you're forgetting names you can say like you go into a platform and if you're buying a ticket what do you generally do the person comes in the first person who comes in stands and the next person who comes in and stands so is the first guy who gets the ticket this guy then this guy gets the ticket and if someone is coming it's a queue that that happens so that that is where the concept comes in first in first out so if i'm saying push one i push one push two i push two push four so i pushed one two and four and the next line i'm saying q dot back plus equal to but back will mean four it does not means this guy back will mean four only so over here i'm saying add plus five this makes it nine i'm now saying q dot back so if i'm saying q dot back it prints the last guy nine okay if i'm saying q dot front prints one just prints does not deletes if i'm saying q dot pop deletes 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 the front guy first 10 guy q dot front is now two so it prints two it is similar and now all the operations are much more similar to stack size and all these things that's how q works again all the operations are happening in constant time now the next thing that we will learn is priority q now as the name recommends priority the guy who has the largest value stays at the top it's similar to q but there is some something that happens inside which you learn probably after a couple of years when you are appearing for interviews but as of now just understand the logic okay so remember if you're declaring priority queue like this the maximum element stays at the top or the largest element if you're using character the largest character if you're using integer the largest integer if you're using the string the lexicographically largest string will stay at the top okay so i'm saying q dot push five so you push in five i say q dot push two so you push in two i say q dot push eight so you push in eight now i say q dot push ten so you push in ten okay now the moment i say pq dot top out of all these elements which one is the largest 10 so it prints 10 and that is the guy who will be at the top now if you are trying to insert something like 3 3 the 3 will go right here the 3 will go right here and this is not a linear data structure inside of it a tree data structure is maintained which you learn in the later half now understand one thing the data is not stored in a linear fashion in like inside at inside a tree is maintained okay which probably you learn someday okay so as of now if i say pq dot pop the topmost element is popped and is popped if i say again now pq dot top is the topmost eight yes so this is how the priority key works again uh, push top and pop main functions the other ones are size and empty size and empty is very simple and swap is also very simple so these are the functions what if i want a priority queue which stores the minimum element at the top then this is how the syntax is priority queue data type vector and this greater int you have to write and if you give this data type and now if you push five five is there if you push two two is there and if you push eight eight is there if you push ten ten is there but this time if you try to access pq.top two will come out so that's how you maintain a very simple minimum priority queue and generically it's known as mean heap and this is known as max heap remember this the terms that you learn in ds algo as you move forward what is the time complexity of push push happens in logarithmic of n top happens in bigo of one and the pop which is the deletion again happens in logarithmic of n so this is how it happens if you don't know what is logarithmic of n no issues just keep this in your mind as you move forward you will understand in ds algo now the next container is very very interesting and that is nothing but the set container now what is set just remember one thing it stores everything in the sorted order and stores unique just remember these couple of points and you know what is a set everything in the sorted and just unique just two points and you're done let's understand so imagine this is the container okay and i say insert one so you insert one imagine you say in place two so you insert two imagine you say insert two unique so will it store two again no it does not no it does not it does not stores two if i say insert four will it yes if i say insert three it will but it will insert it here again a very important thing sorted stores in a sorted order at first 
it will have one then it will have two then it will have three then it will have four everything in the sorted fashion so it stores everything in the sorted fashion so this is how the set will be storing again a container is it a linear container no a tree is maintained so i'm just explaining you this via this bucket but inside of this there is an entire tree which is maintained again which you learn as you move forward so insert and place works in a similar fashion sorted and unique okay now there are functions if i say set dot find three and this is the set so it will return an iterator remember this returns an iterator which points to this three which points to this three it returns an iterator which points to this three okay so basically this is an iterator remember iterator points to the address perfect now if i say set dot find six is six here no if an element is not in the set please hear me out properly if an element is not here in the set it will always return set dot end that means an iterator which points to right after the end imagine the set is having one two four five and you did set dot find three okay and you don't have a three so you will have an iterator end this is the iterator which points after five after five that's where dot find will turn the iterator to be it points afterwards okay and after this there is set dot erase very simple erases this guy five erases this guy five out of it like if this is the set if this is the set it will delete five it will simply delete five you don't have to think anything deletes five and maintains the sorted order deletes five and maintains the sorted order now as i said set is nothing but unique and sorted so if you're trying to count if it exists if it exists it will only have one occurrence because it does contain unique and if it does not exist it will have zero so if one is there in the set it will give you one like one occurrence if it is not it will give you zero as simple as that okay you can also erase like you can either give the element to be erased like you can give the element to be erased or you can give that okay this is the address or the iterator please go and erase this iterator as simple as that now in vector we did learn about erase start comma end similar thing also works over here if you want to erase everything yes if you want to erase everything between 2 and 4 imagine you had something like this so 2 is here 4 is here if you get the first guy if you get the second guy so if you do find, you'll get the two's iterator. If you do find a four, you'll get the four's iterator. So it deletes two and three. Remember this, it deletes two and three, not four. Four is this bracket and this is this. Please remember this. Now in set, there are other functions like size, empty, swap. Everything is similar to vector. That is begin. All of these are similar to vector. So I will not be explaining them. The most important are find, count and insert. These are the most important ones and as well as it is. Now, they have something as a lower bound and an upper bound. So I will be linking a video in the description which explains lower bound in depth and upper bound in depth. So please go back and watch lower bound and upper bound. Once you have seen that, you will actually understand how does this lower bound and upper bound work in a set. It's the exact same that will be taught in the video which is in the description so please make sure you watch it now in set everything happens in logarithmic time complexity if you're inserting it takes logarithmic if you're erasing it takes logarithmic everything happens in a logarithmic time complexity again if you don't know login no issues please remember this in your head now we did learn about a uh, set and i said sorted and unique that means it will just contain one occurrence of two you can insert thousands of occurrences of two but it will just store one occurrence of two but there is something as multi-set. If you define multi-set, it only obeys sorted and will not obey unique. It will store multiple occurrence. Like if you try to insert one, 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 stores all the occurrence. And if you try to erase one, but all the occurrences are erased this time. But if you do an erase one, it erases every one. And this time count will count you the number of ones in the multi-set. But if you want to delete, imagine your multi-set is containing three ones. And I just want to delete one occurrence of one or two occurrence of one or three occurrence of one. So what I can do is I can just find out the first occurrence of one. So I'll just do multi set dot find because I know find points to the iterator. 
and I'll say erase that i to it. Instead of saying erase element, because if I say, understand, if I say erase element, it erases all the elements. But if I say erase address, it only erases that portion. It only erases that portion. And I don't know, it is like two, two ones. So I say find one and go till two. Go till two. So it will erase both of them. Both of them. So either erase element, erase address, or erase starting address and right after the end. That's it. The iterators. And rest all functions are same as set. Stores everything in the sorted, but not unique. Stores multiple occurrence. Like one, 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 two, three, three, four. It can store multiple occurrences as well. So that is the definition of multi-set. Now we did learn about set. We did learn about multi-set. Now there is something as unordered set. Everything is similar to set. The only thing that is omitted, like it stores unique. The only thing omitted is it does not stores in the sorted order. We don't know how it will store. It has randomized order. It has randomized order. Like if I put in one, after that I put in five, after that I put in two, after that I put in three, after that I put in six, it can have this order, it can have any order in the world, but it will just have unique elements. Like if I try to insert one again, it will say I have one, I have one. And in most of the cases, the time complexity is big O of one. Everything, like all the operations are same, insert, erase, all the operations are same, but only the lower bound and upper bound function does not work. All the operations work, but the lower bound and the upper bound functions do not work. Remember this, all operations are similar to set and they do not store everything in sorted order. So all the operations are generically in a big O of one constant time, but in the worst case, which happens once in a millennium, like if the data is pro like possibly given in such a way that they want you to explore the worst case, which does not happen. Then the unordered set goes for a big O of a linear time. It goes for the worst case. Again, does not happens every day, happens once in a blue moon. The time complexity goes till big O of n. You can just write them down in notes. You will understand these things when you move across or when you grow in experience. That's how the unordered set works. So the next container that we will be learning is a map container. Okay. Now you can think this as something like just take a task where I say in your college, there will be like, there might be multiple people with Raj name, but how do you distinguish themselves by roll numbers, right? One Raj might have a roll number of 23. The other Raj might have a roll number of 25. The other Raj might have of 28. So, you know, this one guy is of roll number 23. The other guy is of roll number 25. The other guy is of roll number 28. So generally this is uh, in, in your class, this is stored like this roll number one, roll number two, roll number three and so on. If there are 50 people, you store it like this. So map, you can think this as a, as a data structure or a container, which says the roll number is my key and over here, the value can be the name. So this is what the data structure means. You store unique keys because you can't have 23 roll numbers twice. You can have it just once. So the keys are unique. The keys are unique, but the values can be like over here, there can be a Raj. Over here, there can be a Raj. So there is one guy with key three who is Raj. There is one guy with key 50 who is Raj. There can be duplicate values, but it has to be a unique key. So you can think map as a container which stores everything in respect of key and values. And very important thing, this key can be of any data structure. It can be integer, sorry, any data type. It can be integer, it can be double, it can be pair, it can be anything. Similarly, this value can be anything. So how do you define map? This is key. This is value. Key is integer. Value is integer. Over here, key is an integer and they're saying value is two integers. Over here, they're saying key is two integers and value is one integer. So you can define it as you wish to. That is on you. This is how you define. Okay. Now, if I'm defining the map, to be this for an example, assume you're defining the map to be this. Now I say one equal to two, it means on the key one, can you please store two? So this is what it stores internally in the map. Internally in the map, it stores one comma two. Next I say, I don't want to store it like this and place three one. So it stores three is the key 
and the value to 3 is 1. It does a similar thing, stores it into the map. Again, I say insert, you can also use insert. 2,4 goes and stores 2,4. And this is how you can store all these three variables. Okay, so in this way, you can actually store for this particular declaration. And remember one thing, map stores unique keys, very, very important. Map stores unique keys in sorted order, something similar to set data structure. Map stores unique keys in sorted order, something similar to set data structure. Okay, now this is the declaration, the second declaration. For this declaration, sorry, uh, this declaration, this is the key. So you have declared the key like this and the value is a single integer. So this is it. For this, it will be storing like, okay, key is 2 comma 3. So this is stored and the value corresponding value is 10. Perfect. So this can be stored like this. That's how it generically stores. Okay. I hope that makes a lot of sense. I told you that everything is stored in a sorted order. So this will at first store 1 comma 2. Then it will store 2 comma 4. Then it will store 3 comma 1. This three lines will be storing like this. So again, if you want to explore or if you want to iterate on the map, one of the ways is you start from begin iterator and you go on till end iterator, similar in the vector. All you do is you say it, you run a for each loop. First time id is here, so it stores in a pair. Next time id is here, it stores in a pair. Next time id is here, it stores in a pair. If it is storing in a pair, this is it dot first and this is it dot second. So first time prints one, two. Next time goes here, prints two, four. Next time goes here, prints three, one. So if you try to do this C out, this is how you can actually traverse in a map and everything is stored in a sorted order of key, in a sorted order of key, not value, sorted order of key. Remember this sorted key is how it stores, no duplicates, all uniques. Okay. Now, if I want to access map of one, if I want to access map of one, it says a value two. It says a value two because at one you're storing two. But if it tries to access 5, will it find 5? There is no 5. So what happens is it says null. But if you want to print it, it actually goes and prints 0 or null. Okay, because it does not exist. So if, it's, if something does not exist, it gives you 0. Okay, so this is how you can easily access for a key. Now, If you want to know the iterator, imagine you want to know where the key to lies, the address of it. So again, the find function will come over here and say map.find3. So this is where you get it the iterator and in order to access this you give a star so this access is this and if you want the value dot second got it it gives you the iterator to the this three comma one okay this it is this so if you give a star it's the element and if you give a second it is the one that's how you can easily access this as well now over here if you try to do dot find five and five is not there it points to nothing but dot and and means after the map after the map okay makes sense and again the low bound and upper bound functions if you have seen the video in the description you can understand how low bound and upper bound works okay and all the other functions like array swap size empty are same so i'm not going to explain it again next thing is multi map similar to map only thing is you can store duplicate keys you can store duplicate keys Something similar to set and multi set, as I told you, right? Duplicate keys, but everything in the sorted order. This time you can store like one comma two, and then you can come across and again store like one comma three, right? So you can store duplicate keys over here. Unordered map, again, unordered map is similar. Only this portion will go across. It will not store in sorted. It will be randomized. It will be randomized, but it will it will not have duplicate as well. It will just have unique keys. Unordered map will have unique keys, but it will not be sorted. And the difference is like the map works in logarithmic of time and the unordered map in the in almost all cases works in constant time. In the worst case, it goes for big of n. Again, this worst case happens once in a blue moon, not always. In almost all the cases, big of one is what appears. So as of now, I can say that I have completed containers and iterators. Now this is not required, not required, no need to learn it, just omit this. Now I'll be telling you the, all the important algorithms like which are mandatory, like you should know. 
and all the other algorithms which I will not teach you will eventually learn while you code but that are not like those are not important so as of now you can just leave it eventually with time if it's required learn at that moment no need to learn it now so let's move across to learn some algorithms now if I say you that hey listen I give you an array of size like 1 5 3 uh, 2 okay of size 4 and I want you to sort it so you will be like let's apply bubble short merge short selection sort so and so but in C++ STL if you just write the line sort a comma it's a four size so this actually means the first position the first position of the first iterator the starting iterator and this means the last iterator a plus four actually means this portion then portion the last iterator again similar to something like start start is included and end is not included so you write the starting iterator which is a which actually points to this and a plus four which actually points to this so all the elements are sorted right after this line it will have one two three five so you don't have to actually use merge short bubble short selection sort it sorts that into one line and if you're using vector the starting is begin this is the ending the starting iterator and the ending iterator so in this way you can sort any container not map all like all not map I'm talking about vectors and arrays over here okay now what if I just wanted like I had something like one three two five and rather let's keep it like five two okay and I wanted just this portion to be sorted so I know a plus two because this is a plus two for sure and I know a plus four right after this is a plus four so only this portion will be sorted so this is how only this portion will be sorted perfect what if I want to sort them in descending order imagine you have like 1 3 5 and 2 I want to sort them in descending order so it's very simple give the starting iterator give the ending iterator the portion that you want to sort and just write greater end yes just write greater end and this is nothing but a comparator an inbuilt comparator which automatically sorts it like I'll teach you comparator automatically will sort it in the descending order like this in a descending order you just need to write greater end and it automatically sorts it into a descending order now what if I want to sort it in some other fashion because as of now we know how to sort it in increasing we know how to sort it in decreasing but what if I want to sort it in my my way because going across you will see that this my way is being used a lot for an example we have declared a pair array and these are the pairs 1 2 2 1 4 1 okay and I want you to sort according to second element like I want you to sort it in, in order of increasing second element please understand I want you to sort it according to increasing second element okay and if the second element is same then sort according to the first element but in decreasing but in decreasing what do I mean by that so as of now can I say the second element is 2 1 and 1 so this 2 comma 1 and 4 comma 1 are the guys who should appear right at the first okay because the second elements are 1 and 1 and after that I can say after that 1 comma 2 will appear because because of this portion so can I say that I've sorted according to the second element but I still have a problem now these couple of guys are having same second element now if they have the same second element I want you to sort it according to the first element but in descending which means I want you to have 4 comma 1 at first and then 2 comma 1 that means among them among them I want you to sort it according to descending so first 4 then 2 and then you can write so first sort it according to the second and if there is a group which is having the same second then among them sort it according to the first so this is my way this is my way like I, it's 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 something like a combination of increasing as well as decreasing so this is where generically you write the first iterator the last iterator and a comp and a comp remember this and a comp now this is nothing but a self-written comparator a self-written comparator and this comparator is nothing but a boolean function is nothing but a boolean function so I've written this but I'll, I'll just teach you how to write it it's very simple you write boolean comparator and this is the function okay 
this has to return a true and a false this has to return a true and a false now go back and see what is the data type that you that you just had and the data type if you see was pair of indent just copy paste and have couple of guys pair one and pair two that's it have couple of guys that's the first thing that you'll do have couple of guys now please understand this that this is pair one and this is pair two so forget about the array forget about the array and now think of these two instances where you have two pairs where you have two pairs this is p1 this is p2 while writing comparator just focus what have you been set sort it according to the second element so you say okay okay if my p1 dot second is already smaller than second that means it's true we are assuming we are assuming that the pair one lies before p2 lies before p2 that is what the assumption is the pair one lies before p2 and that is okay if the second guy is lesser than this second guy i'm okay they should actually so they are in the correct order this comparator says are two guys in the correct order or not and i'm saying they are in the correct order they are in the correct order because this guy is smaller than this guy and that is what i was said so if they are they are in the correct order but but i know one thing if it's the opposite if this is the case i will say they are not in the correct order because if i have two guys okay and imagine this is 5 and this is 4 and i'm saying p1 occurs before p2 this is wrong this is wrong if this second is actually greater than this i know this is wrong so i say they are not in the correct order so what happens is comparator internally says p1 and p2 are not in the correct order can you please swap them so apparently 4 comes before 5 this is what happens so they do internal comparisons and they swap so i told them false they are not so they will swap internally but do we have any other conditions we have what if they are same because that's the only condition that is left that is the only condition because if if these two conditions do not happen i know we will come to a point that they are same i don't need to write a if because that's the only condition that is left they are same now if they are same we'll again try to evaluate i know if they are same this is p1 and this is p2 and this time it is descending so this guy is greater than this guy it's okay otherwise it's not so can i say if p1 dot first is actually greater than p2 dot first it's okay because this is what i was looking for else i say it's not if they equal it's fine i i if even if i swap or do not swap it's okay so can i say if it's greater it's okay that's what i'm looking for but if it's not that's false please swap it if it's not i need in descending can you please just swap it so you just analyze everything whenever you try to write a comparator always analyze everything in terms of two pairs don't think in terms of arrays just pick up yes i repeat you just need to do one thing just pick up one pair just take another pair and try to analyze p1 and p2 that is your job so you have learned about comparators so any time there is my way my way sorting you can write the comparators just need to write this and you should be done just focus on the data type and try to just have evaluate two data types and write it nothing different okay so this is again one more stl which is very important which is built in popcorn so if number 7 what is the binary of 7 it's 1 1 1 that's the binary of 7 so as a built in popcorn it says okay this has three bits as one generally uh, number 7 means 0 0 0 0 0 0 Like these are the thirty-two bits inside the computer. In thirty-two bits, it's zero 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 and one one one. So built-in pop count says how many ones are there or how many set bits are there. So it will return three set bits. If this number would have been six, which is nothing but one one zero, six is nothing but one one zero. So built-in pop count would have returned two, the number of set bits. Okay. If the number is long long, then built-in pop count becomes built-in pop count LL. built in pop count ll if the number is long long integer will not suffice there perfect now the last thing is not the last second last thing is next permutation now if i write a string as 1 2 3 and i want to have all the permutations of it all the permutations so what i can say is okay listen i'm going to have the string 
and i know the, i know the next permutation is 1 3 i know the next permutation like if i talk about dictionary order 2 1 3 the next permutation is 2 3 1 the next is 3 1 2 the next is 3 2 1 can i say these are the dictionary like these are the six permutations that you can have three factorial is six so if you want to print them what do you do is you first print the first string then you say can you have the next permutation please can you have the next permutation and it takes you the string which was this becomes 132 and now you print it again the string now becomes 213 and you print it again the string becomes 231 you print it again the string becomes 312 and you print it again the string becomes 321 and you print it right after this it goes to null it says no more permutations it returns a false if there are no more permutation it returns a false and if it returns a false the while loop breaks and this is how you can print all permutations of a string here's a catch what if the string was 231 then it would have started from 231 and the next permutation of 231 is 312 and the next is 321 so it would have just printed like first tens then this then this right after this no permutations so it's very important that if you want to print all the permutations you start from the sorted guy like you just start from the sorted guy and you can easily sort it you know the stl now in this fashion you start from the sorted guy and that's how you can easily print it now the last one is max element imagine you have an array like 1 10 5 6 and you want the maximum element so if you give max element start iterator and iterator it gives you the address and if you give the star it gives you the element similarly min element is also there right so these are the algorithms that are generically used in ds algo in your day to day life all the other algorithms are there but they are not widely used and you will not be requiring them so whatever stl i have taught in this video is more than enough to get started with c++ so just in case you have understood everything it's an honest request that get into the comment section and just write one line comment because that is the only thing that keeps me motivated to make these kind of content and if you probably if the first time on this channel please do consider subscribing because i have a lot of content regarding trees graphs dynamic programming dsa that might help you in your longer run so please make sure you subscribe to this channel as well and you can like this video and yeah please please do comment because that keeps me going with this i'll be wrapping up this video let's meet in some other video till then bye bye take care see ya whenever your heart is broken